Okay, here we go. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Yeah, my name's Sean. I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you, everyone doing service. Thank you, to, especially to Steve, for asking me to come and share with you guys. Um, we're talking about step one and two and three. <clears throat> but before that, I'll, you know, I'm going to give you a little bit of background to myself. Um, I had a really good upbringing. Um, I've come from east side of the UK. And I'll go into that a little bit further. Um, I'm now on the west side. And um, I came here specifically to get well. Um, I had a fantastic upbringing as a child. A few traumas along the way, but nothing to speak of. And then uh, I started uh, work uh, over on the east side, uh, driving trains. That was my that was my fulfilment in life. I, I drove trains for thirty two years on the eastern region of the UK. Long distance, short distance, goods, passenger. Uh, I've done quite a bit, you know, and uh, so I had a reputable job and uh, a responsible job as well, you know, especially when I was driving passenger trains with all them people behind me. When I started work at the age of 16, that's when I found alcohol. And that, that stuck with me all through my drinking career because some people call it a career. It was a, it was a job for me, <laughs> drinking, you know, it's, uh, it was crazy. During that time, I was training up to be a train driver. I met a, a woman and we eventually got married in 1984. We had four daughters. Today I've got nine grandchildren and uh, I look forward to going back and seeing them um, as much as I can. But obviously this work gets in the way, you know, of doing, being able to do that. But the pros far outweigh the cons for me in this program today. So as, as we were bringing our children up and um, I had, a, say, a good job, uh, keeping that job down. You know, the book describes on 2021 about the functioning alcoholic because I know now today that I'm, I'm genetically wired wrong. <laughs> you know, I know about the twofold illness the physical allergy and the mental obsession today, which I didn't know before I came to AA. So life was like going good, you know, holidays, all them good stuff that we do. Um, and I didn't think I had a problem, you know. And then... Um, Page 2021 20, also describe about the heavy drinker. And what I know today is that this illness is progressive. Um, it can creep up on you. The book describes it cunning, baffling and powerful. Without help, it is too much for us as individuals. And... Um, Things started to happen, you know, things started to fall apart a little bit, you know, along the way. I started to miss work a few days, you know, because of this. I think they call it binge drinking now, a heavy bout of drinking for a night or a, a day, and then I could leave it alone after that. But eventually... Um, the time that I know now had caught up with me and uh, 
as I say, I was losing a lot. Um, eventually, I'd, I'd retired off the railway and started a new job in engineering. Um, and uh, I found that I could not live life on life's terms. Um, I was full of fear because I didn't, I, a fear of the unknown had me in the grips. And uh, eventually my wife had had enough of me and uh, she wanted to divorce, but we never got divorced until I came to Westside and into a treatment centre. My family, my four daughters, by this time had grown up and had kids of their own, as I say, and uh, they didn't know anything about alcoholism. Most important person that didn't know anything about alcoholism was me because, call it deluded, call it not knowing anything. My conception of a, an alcoholic was... Um, that one on a park bench, you know, so someone in the doorway sleeping on cardboard. Someone scruffy, not washed. That was my idea of an alcoholic. How wrong was I, you know? I drunk enough to make me feel restless, irritable and discontented. I was full of the bedevilments. Angry, lonely, and tired. So I moved out of the family home and got into a bedsit land, and that's where I stayed. Barely hanging on to a job that I was trying to keep. When I did arrive there to do some work, most of it was either scrapped or had to be reworked. And uh, that's a little bit my story. Um, that's where I come from. I had reached the point again on 2021 where it says about the real alcoholic, the full blown alcoholic who's lost the power of choice and lost the power of control. And by that time, um, I didn't know what to do. I thought I was going to die. Um, many trips to the hospital, um, many trips to doctors telling me you had to stop. But I couldn't. And that's what this illness is all about. I, we could, we cannot. As, Alcoholics cannot stop once we put that first drink inside us. Sparks of the allergic reaction. The doctor's opinion talks about that. I'm going into step one now. Doctor's opinion talks about the twofold illness. Physical allergy. I'm allergic to alcohol. And I didn't think I was allergic to it because I drank enough of it, you know. But it wasn't until I, this was explained to me how this works. Um, and there's a, a chapter written in the book, How It Works, chapter five. I was still deluded. I didn't know where I was. was. <coughs> this illness took me, the book describes, to the gates of insanity and possibly death. And I had near death experiences. Five years ago, I gave up. I had what I called surrendered to this cunning, baffling, powerful disease of addiction. Specifically, alcoholism. I know now that the alcohol was just a, a substance. 
I suffer from alcoholism. And the doctor, as I say, the doctor's opinion describes that. And when I, when I first went through the, the doctor's opinion, he told me about the twofold illness, physicality and the mental obsession. And then he goes on to say, Bill Wilson, our co founder, well, our founder, and uh, all the guys, the first 100, and Dr. Bob, of course. Uh, but Bill writes one, two, three, four, five, five types. He describes five types of alcohol, or alcoholic. And uh, denial. And I thought I was doomed, you know, I was doomed to an alcoholic death. So as I say, I'd surrendered. I took a, I went to a treatment recovery service in the town where I was living and asked for help. Barely, barely capable of even doing that. Sometime, somewhere along the line, I must have picked up enough strength to be able to do that. And I came west coast, uh, I, before that I went down to on the south coast, a place called Portsmouth, I've done a two week detox there and I was shipped over here uh, to a treatment centre. Grateful for that treatment centre today because they gave me the chance to look at myself when they said when I came in there, I, they said to me, this is a spiritual program. It's knocked me back a bit. And it wasn't until it was defined in there in the first week or so, I started to get some clarification and understanding about the spiritual side of life, spiritual side of this program. And it's a program of change, you know? I thought everyone had to change for me. I'm the ill person here. You know, I'm the man barely hanging on to a job by the skin of his teeth. I'm, I'm the man that is barely hanging on to his family before it disintegrates around my feet. So step one was, uh, and the book describes step one. Uh, in the first four chapters of the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, Doctor's Binion. Of course, my favourite chapter, Bill's story. Some people can't recognise Bill, the way he thought, the way he thinks, the way he acts. Well, I had some acceptance around that and now I can see I had some understanding of his story. And the more I do it, the more I read this chapter, it becomes aware, I become aware that he was just like me. And of course, it, you know, it goes on uh, all in step one. From Bill's story, it goes on to, with me, sorry, uh, there is a solution, of course, the two powers to explain to me about the two powers, the two powers of the fellowship and the two powers of the power of the program of action, the spiritual program of action. So I put there, when I was going through this work, there is a solution, there is hope. There is hope today for us. So step one for me was done in treatment for the first time, still not really understanding. And it says, you know, step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. You know, I don't like admitting to anything. I'm that sort of guy. I'm very skeptical. I don't like putting my name down for anything. 
a little bit different today because I know where I'm going. But admitting that I'm a drunk, admitting I'm an alcoholic was the biggest, biggest task I had to get my head around because all them experiences of me knowing drunks and in the street and I didn't think I was one of them guys. I had a job, I had a family, I had a house, I had a car, I had all, everything. Slowly but surely this illness started to take that away from me. And my life had become unmanageable. Um, that goes on um, after there is a solution. We talk about in chapter three, more about alcoholism. And uh, it talks about the mind, that twofold illness. The physical allergy, yes, I've got my head around that. I'm allergic to alcohol. It sparks off the phenomenon of craving. But the twofold is talking about the mind, the mental obsession. To want more. I could not stop at one. I could not stop at one drink. I craved more. I drank more. And I slept more. I slept the clock around, never seeing daylight some days. Someone said to me, right under there, more about alcoholism, the truth explains the truth in the first few chapters of that, all around set one, the insane mind, less than, less than whole. We can't see the truth from the false. I couldn't. So I've done a little step one, um, little step one inventory, if you like, in the treatment centre. And uh, it was like a question and answer. And I answered all the questions. And I, then the penny dropped that I am an alcoholic. I'm suffering from an al alcoholism. And without help, it is too much for me. And then, of course, in step two, we're going to talk about we became willing or coming to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. During my childhood, guys, I, I had a, a recollection of who they talk about in here, God. Uh, as a child, my mother and father took me to church. So I had a vague idea of what they were talking about when they said, when Bill wrote about in the book, God, the word God. And my conception of it and my thoughts and feelings on it, because it wasn't, it was clouded with calamity and uh, pomp and all that sort of stuff. And I, in the end, I didn't want anything to do with it, especially when I started work, because God was put on the back burner for me. So all that knowledge as a child, I'd built up. The book describes also that in deep down in every woman, man, and child, there's a fundamental idea of the word God, you know. So I took that with me from my step two, my conception of God. It also tells me not only to be honest, but open-minded as well about a new experience, which I'm having now with God by my side, continue to seek him, continue to find him. So I didn't have too much trouble on that. In step three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of that power. 
create an air cell. Turn our will and our life over to it. And I'm thinking, well, what do I have to do here? Turn everything over to God? Don't I have free will anymore? To describe selfish, self-centeredness. That was the root of my trouble. And it wasn't until I came up to um, chapter four, we agnostics, which helped me a hell of a lot, you know, not only in step two, but in three, you know. Do I have control of my drinking? Do I have a choice today? With when I was in, in the madness, you know. And we agnostics without knowledge. I have some vague recollection of God. And that was a, as a child. But I started to put the power of the fellowship into my life, the power of the rooms, the people I saw in them rooms that had recovered, that were working the program, that were recovering. And I wanted some of that. I wanted some of that. It says here, to be doomed an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not always alternatives to face. You know? What's it to be? I had to make that decision. Not only to hand my will and my life over to it, for guidance, but also, what, how do I want to live today? On a spiritual plane? Or do I know I call it there? What it tells me is I've got two alternatives. Two alternatives. And me being me, I, I thought I was too young to die. <laughs> and uh, I wanted what you guys had. I craved it, I wanted it, and I put the action in to do it, to get what you guys had. And I found out later that step three doesn't mean to hand everything over. You know, for me, if I'm in trouble, because it goes on from four to nine, after step three, after that beautiful step three prayer, four to nine is the action steps. And um, I won't get into that, but um, maybe for another day, but I remember taking my step three because I, I took these steps twice, once in that treatment centre. We only went up the step seven in there. But when I come out of that facility and face life on life's terms, I still had that support network around me with the fellowship of AA. I found myself a sponsor, a guy who was willing and honest and open-minded. And he loved me enough to tell me the truth about me. I'm indebted to that man today. He's still my sponsor today after five years of sobriety. He took me through the program quite quickly because I was in treatment for six months. By that time, I'd done a, what they call a primary and into a secondary. And then I came out after six months with not much knowledge about anything because I found out that my internal condition, not the external stuff that was going on in my life, it was my internal condition, the spiritual malady. I was suffering 
I would say, more than when I was when I was drinking. The pain I was going through, the torture. It was absolute torture. And it wasn't until that man picked me up and went through the work. It took me f two weeks. It was fearless. It was thorough. And we went through that work. One to nine. And then, of course, now today, I live in 10, 11, and 12. So one, step one, I admitted now that I am powerless over alcohol. I know that one more drink, if I put that substance inside me, would send me back where I was before I drank, before I left, that last drink, or it might kill me this time. I'm not prepared to take that chance. My life has started to get back on track as well. In step two, I came to believe with that little knowledge I had of the word God. And I put that in a good practice. That stood me in good stead to connect to a power greater than myself. And that power is in my heart, in my soul, deep down inside. I can turn to it whenever I want, and I do turn to it a lot when I'm not spiritually well, because my traits, my defects of character and my shortcomings come to the head. It's still there. And then I handed my will and my life out of the care of God. And we went to a little church just up the hill from here. And uh, it was a beautiful summer day. I always remember it. Walking shoulder to shoulder with my sponsor. We went into that churchyard and there's a little, little garden area. The trees, the sun was beating down. We got on our knees and we said this beautiful third step prayer. I believe then today, that day, that moment in time, I'd had a spiritual experience. I felt the hand of God come upon me. It was a wonderful experience. I shall never forget it. But of course, I live, you know, in the day to day steps today 10, 11, and 12. So, from doing this work in one, two, and three in a treatment centre, the real journey for me started when I came out of treatment and worked with a sponsor. As I say, a man armed with the facts that was willing to tell me the truth about me, willing to tell the truth about this program of action. I'm eternally grateful today for what got in my life. I'm five years sober, just August gone. I've got my own flat in Western Supermare. I've got a program of action that I can turn to. I do occasionally get back, go back to see my now ex-wife and my children. But most of my time is now taken up here in Western Town, Western Superman. It's a lot of work to be done. And I believe God's picked me out to do that work for him because I think he's sick and tired of seeing people die from this illness. So he puts me, people like me, people like some of you guys that have done this work as well, puts us in the path of that newcomer, that 12th step. 
having had that spiritual awakening, which I did in step three. And I continue to have spiritual experiences as well. This is a beautiful program of action, a beautiful program that I, five years ago, was looking and I didn't think I'd ever find it. Eventually I did. Now how long I've been going on for, I felt quite emotional as well. You know, a little tear in my eye. Because I can say I've recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And I will continue I'm in a good position now where I've got my own flat. I have people in here to go through the work. I do 12 step calls. I sponsor people. That's the gift. They are gifts from God for me. I'm eternally grateful for what I have. And I'm eternally grateful to God in my life today. Just want to remind us, guys, the third step prayer. And I'm going to finish on this. Right at the top of my sheet, of course it is. God, I offer myself on a daily basis to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me, continue to relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Amen. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to hearing back from you guys. God bless you. Thank you.